night may be long and the dark may be deep, but the answers are there to be found. Whether it's the normal, the abnormal, or the paranormal, you're in the right place. Let's go Beyond Reality. Good evening, good morning, welcome everyone. It is Beyond Reality Radio. I'm J.V. Johnson. Thanks for being here tonight as we kick off another week of great programs. It's always a pleasure to have you along, and it's a it's an honor uh, to have all the radio stations along that carry this program and send it out to millions of people every night. So thank you, uh, stations who have become part of the Beyond Reality Radio affiliate list. By the way, if you're looking for that list because you want to find a station in your area that carries the program, just go to beyondrealityradio.com. The list is there. You'll also find the Beyond Reality Radio coffee mug, and if you haven't gotten one of those, um, there are dozens of people that have and they claim and those are their words okay they claim coffee has never tasted better or tea or hot chocolate or whatever you soup for that matter um the uh, beyond reality radio coffee mug is available for sale right on the website also check us out at uh, facebook at beyond reality radio and i'd invite you to come along and join my facebook page as well give it a like a follow whatever you do these days i'm not even sure there's follow there's like there's pretend i don't even know but it's (laughs) it's uh uh, jv johnson on uh facebook or it's also jvj paranormal if um, i'm not sure why there's two but you can get to it either way Uh, So a lot of great stuff going on. We appreciate you being here tonight. We're going to be talking about many interesting things that have been written by author Tim Schwartz. He's written about a uh, what he's calling the eighth wonder of the world, Geff the Talking Mongoose. Now, this is a very interesting story. Don't let that quick title make you think it's it's uh, you know, it's it's strange or it is strange, but it's uh, not worth listening to because it's a fascinating story. Um, so we'll be talking about that. Plus, uh, Tim has written about Nikola Tesla, and that's always a great topic of interest here on the program. So we'll talk about that some and time travel. So we've got a trio of great topics with our guest, Tim Swartz, tonight. We will take your phone calls later in the program at 844-687-7669. We enjoy doing that. So uh, we'll make a point of getting some of those calls in. Um so, you know, what did you think of the? Uh, I can't say the word because it's a it's a trademark or copyrighted word, whatever. But what did you think of the big game yesterday? Well, if you're from New England, uh, I bet you're pretty darn happy. And uh, being in Cooperstown, New York, I'm close enough to New England that uh, I wasn't jumping on board the Patriots haters. I felt as though um, it was pretty cool to see Tom Brady at his age. Um, and his level of success become uh, what I think he's now won, uh, been uh, a winner in a Super Bowl more than any other. He was tied for first. Now he's sole owner of that record in first place. Six victories. Is that right? Do I have my numbers correct? Um, it wasn't a particularly exciting game, was it? It was kind of eh, but it was a good game. Uh, you know, it was a defensive game. And and, and uh, if you look at it that way, uh, and it was actually pretty exciting to see both of those defenses uh be so effective against such high power offenses. So um, it was a pretty good, it was a pretty cool game for that respect. Have you also noticed that, um, um, have you also noticed that uh, the commercials have gotten kind of meh? You know, for so many years, these build up to these uh, Super Bowl commercials have been what everybody's talked about. And um, last, last year, and particularly this year, they uh, there really wasn't much. I mean, there was a couple okay ones, you know, what, whatever. But it, it seemed obvious that they were de-emphasizing the commercial component. They still were running commercials, obviously, but they weren't um, touting them as you know being anything spectacular. And they truly weren't anything spectacular. So uh, I don't know we'll see how that goes. You know, you, they kind of ebb and flow because you build up expectations year after year after year. And uh, yeah, you're, I, I, someone in the chat room commented that there was a lot of robots and AI uh, themes throughout the, uh, the the commercials. That's true. I did notice that. Um, but yeah, you know, they'll downplay it for a couple of years and they'll come back. Of course, as media changes, who knows how it's going to uh, going to work. I did have an opportunity. My son, who uh, we've talked about in the program before, is actually uh, going to school in Holland. And um, he was able to uh, pay-per-view the game and uh, watched it and FaceTimed me while I was watching it. So we kind of got to watch it together. It was kind of cool. Although, <laughs> I think it started at midnight for him and ran to like, what, 3 in the morning, 4 in the morning, whatever it was. Anyway, um, so we have, like I said, a great program coming up tonight. I do want to remind you that we've got some pretty neat events coming up as well. 
In fact, on uh, February 12th, what is that? It's going to be a week from Thursday. Rebecca Foster makes the trip uh, to upstate New York, and she and I are going to um, B-Side Ballroom and Supper Club in Oneonta, New York, to do a gallery reading. She's going to do the gallery reading. I'm going to host it. Uh, The tickets are almost sold out, but I do know there are some available still because I went over the uh, seating chart today. Uh, So if you have any interest in that, go to B-Side Ballroom. uh, I think it's bsideballroom.com. But either way, just Google it and you'll find it and uh, you can grab yourself a ticket or two to be part of the gallery reading. It's the first time Rebecca's appeared at something like this. And then after that, she and I travel to Edmonton, Alberta in Canada, and we do a uh, an event there called Dead by Con. And I know it's a bit of an odd name, but it's a horror fan convention. There'll be a lot of horror uh, movie celebrities there, plus Rebecca and I will be there. She'll be conducting readings at her table throughout the weekend, plus uh, you know signing autographs, so we both will, and, and uh enjoying that so uh that's going to be a great weekend and that is of course the 15th 16th and 17th it's called dead by con you can get more information about that event by going to dead by b by is by dead by con dot ca for canada so i think i got all that stuff taken care of you know mondays into tuesday night in the morning uh is always a bit challenging to try to remember what we have to talk about but i think I think we got all that stuff handled. Um, Okay, so we're going to take a break. And when we come back, we will bring our guest, Tim Swartz, in. And we will start this conversation about Geth, the talking mongoose, who is the eighth, or was anyway, the eighth wonder of the world. It's Beyond Reality Radio. Did you know that online retailers like Amazon have constant deals that can save you money on the things you buy every day? It's no joke. Save 40%, 50%, even 80% on great products. And all you have to do is know about them. Noodle Shark is the way to be alerted when something good is coming your way. Noodle Shark is the social media page that lists great deals that not only save you money, but give you the deals before anyone else has them. All you have to do is find Noodle Shark on Facebook. Search it as The Noodle Shark. That's The Noodle Shark. Because you deserve to save too. Become a shark. Shark and save. I forgot to mention we've got some uh, very interesting programs coming up the rest of the week, too. In fact, we've got actually what would be considered kind of a uh, um, a best of. Uh, I hate to use that word because that's what sometimes we use when we bring a, a recorded program on. But it's not going to be recorded. It's all live, but it's some of our best guests. We've got John Potash joining us. He's an author and documentarian. That'll be tomorrow night in the first hour. He was on, gosh, I don't know, maybe about a year ago talking about his book called Drugs as Weapons Against Us, the CIA War on Musicians and Activists. Well, he's made it into a documentary, and uh, he's going to be talking about that. In the second hour of the program, Rhonda and Dwight Hull, they're paranormal researchers, psychic mediums, they'll be talking about their new book called Conversations with Spirits of the Southwest, a continued journey into the paranormal And uh, that'll be in the second hour of tomorrow night's program. Wednesday, Dr. Knowledge. He's been on the program a few times, and he's always a fascinating guy to talk to. Uh, His real name is Charles Reichblum, and he'll be on talking about his book called Fascinating Facts. It's actually the all-time book of Fascinating Facts. That's Wednesday night's program. Then, of course, Thursday is the first Thursday of February. You know what that means. Our guest will be Rebecca Foster who I just mentioned is going to be at a gallery reading in, in, in uh, Oneonta, New York, and then at uh, um, Dead by Con in uh, Edmonton, Canada. But she'll be on the program Thursday night taking your phone calls. The phone lines, uh, <laughs> they light up like crazy. It's like a Christmas tree when she's on. Uh, they almost melt down the system. So uh, if, you're, <laughs> if you're at all inclined to get a reading from Rebecca on Thursday night when she's on the program, get your dialing fingers ready because it's tough to get through but that's just the nature of it anyway uh, but tonight we have an awesome program as well tim swartz is an author uh we're going to be talking about several of his books and i want to welcome tim to the program tim it's great to have you on beyond reality radio why thank you jason it's a pleasure to be with you tonight. actually jv jason's not with us tonight Oh, hi, JV. So you, uh, first of all, I want to mention your website is called conspiracyjournal.com. You've gotten many books to your credit, including The Lost Journals of Nikola Tesla, America's Strange and Supernatural History, Time Travel Fact, Not Fiction, and is it Geff or Jeff the Talking Mongoose? It's Jeff. Jeff the Talking Mongoose, okay. And uh, the eighth wonder of the world. Now, see, obviously, you've written about a lot of very varied topics, uh, all strange, all interesting. Uh, where'd you get your start in all this? 
Oh my gosh! Well, um, like a lot of people who are uh, into you know the, the the weird and paranormal, I got to start at a, a fairly young age. Though um, I, I was kind of actually drug into it, kicking and screaming. Uh, about uh, third grade, I was given uh, an assignment from the uh, newspaper to uh, do an oral presentation in front of the class about uh, flying saucers. Uh, flying saucers were, uh, you know, they, they were in the news and the headlines at the time. I knew nothing about flying saucers; could have cared less. You know, I'm an Indiana boy. You know, I was interested in, you know, car racing, the Indianapolis 500, stuff like that. So, you know, I gave my presentation, and that was that was it. I was pegged by everybody as the flying saucer guy. I was the guy who believed in Martians, little green men, things like that. You know that that was the end of me, <laughs> but um, what ended up being fascinating to me was that you know when uh, people would uh, go and make fun of you in front of you know everybody else, they would later come back by themselves and say, you know, I don't believe in that kind of stuff, but and then they proceed to tell me a story about how you know, say their house was haunted or when they were on vacation, their family saw uh, a UFO, something like that. Yeah, you know, it's, it's funny well, It's it's funny you mentioned that because one of the things that I always joke about when we talk about um, our work, you know, invested in ghosts, ghost hunting, that kind of thing, is frequently we'll have people come up to us when we're at an event and say, you know, I don't believe in that stuff, but let me tell you what happened when I was eight years old. You know, my grandfather appeared magically at my bed. He'd been dead for three, you know, that kind of thing. Everybody seems to have a story, yet some of people just won't accept what they saw as real. Yes, exactly. And, you know, I mean, we don't, you know, currently, at least as far as I know, you know, we don't have, uh, you know, a ghost in a jar in a laboratory or, right. uh, you know, a UFO. <laughs> well, supposedly, yeah. <laughs> we don't have a UFO in a hangar someplace. All we have are the stories from these people. And that's what drew me in, you know, were these, these, these absolutely fascinating stories by people who wanted some kind of explanation. You know, they, they wanted to be able to tell their story and not be made fun of. You know, not be, you know, told, oh, yeah, you're crazy. You know, that, that sort of thing. A lot of people uh, are concerned about that. A lot of people don't want to be able, don't want to tell the story for fear of ridicule. Um, I think that's changed a little bit over the last maybe ten years or so. What do you think? It's starting to it, change. It really has, uh, and a lot of that I think has to do with you know reality television, right? And and the predominance of you know so many uh, uh, ghost hunting shows and, and uh, UFO shows, Bigfoot especially is is, is popular right now. Uh, so uh, a lot of that stuff is is just you know right there on you know a person's frontal cortex. But you know it used to be that uh, most people, with the exception of uh, you know people like you and me, had no idea about this kind of stuff. And so when they would have an unusual experience, there they didn't have any place in their brain to categorize it. You know, I mean, we go through life and our daily experiences. Our brain has this, you know, has various locations on how to categorize them. You know, stop at the red light, uh, go to work, open your, you know, uh, open the files on your uh, computer, that sort of thing. You don't have a uh, a little file for a circular craft landed in front of me and little gray guys <laughs> with big eyes got out and uh, kidnapped me. You know. <laughs> So when, when people have this kind of, of unusual experience, naturally they're either going to think they're crazy, ignore it completely, or just actually just freak out. <laughs> Or all of the above at times. <laughs> so you started writing about, or started, you know, as the UFO guy, you kind of got that label. Um, but obviously you didn't stay the UFO guy. You might be doing UFO stuff, but you branched out. Oh, well, I was always, you know, after it started with, with UFOs, I mean, I, I then became uh, fascinated by the subject because of all the different things that, that people were coming and telling me. So... I wanted to know more. And, you know, at that time, you know, you were able to go to the drugstore and, and buy a relatively inexpensive paperback book, you know, 50 cents or so, 
on on practically any kind of, of weird paranormal subject. You know, Brad Steiger used to put out these absolutely fantastic little books that just, you know, each chapter would be a different kind of, of, of paranormal and, or unusual story. And, and, you know, I mean, I got to know Brad uh, really well uh, years later, and I, I, I kind of based my own types of research on the stuff that, that Brad was doing as well. And so, you know, I mean, all of it to me is fascinating, and, and oddly enough, uh, a lot of this stuff seems to have some kind of unusual connectedness. You know, I mean, there have been uh, uh, people who have seen um, uh, Bigfoot in areas where there's been a lot of UFO sightings. They, you know, oddly enough, there's also a, an odd connection between um, hauntings and uh, UFO sightings. So, uh, you know, you just. You, you start looking into one subject, and then pretty soon it just opens up the floodgates, and everything uh, comes pouring in. Well, I think there's a you know it's the same curiosity that'll make you interested in exploring and looking for UFO evidence is going to be there um, when somebody mentions Bigfoot or somebody mentions ghosts or somebody mentions you know one of the many other uh, cryptids of other kind. You know um, that same curiosity, if it's in you, it's going to be in you for almost everything. Oh yeah, uh, definitely. Though you know, it's it is funny. There are a lot of researchers who have focused on one discipline. Say they, you know, they they, they study nothing but uh, Bigfoot, Sasquatch sightings, or you know, UFOs or whatever, and they're they can become really insulted if you <laughs> mention cases where. You know, Bigfoots have been seen around uh, UFO hotspots or, or, or things like that. And I think that uh, some people have just kind of tunnel visioned themselves into, you know, this is what it is, and there are no variations one way or the other. And I try to be just the, just the opposite, you know, because I, uh, and, and, you know, maybe it's just the. Uh, that that odd bend that I have in my own brain, uh, I just I just see all of these connections uh, uh, with all of this stuff that you know you would label paranormal. But Tim, what is conspiracyjournal dot com? What do you got going on there? Well, Conspiracy Journal, uh, it's it, it, it's kind of an aggregate site. Uh, we we put it together um, with my uh, publisher Timothy Green Beckley. And uh, it's just a site where uh, all of us who uh, write for uh, global communications, you know, we it gives us a place to uh, put our work up, advertise our books, uh, things like that. And there's a lot there for folks to check out. So let's move on to your book called Geff the Talking Mongoose, the Eighth Wonder of or Jeff the Talking Mongoose, the eighth wonder of the world. What is the story of Jeff the Talking Mongoose? Mm. Uh, this, this is just an absolutely fascinating story. And, uh, you know, I think that a lot of people who uh, have been into researching the paranormal may be uh, familiar with the case. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of people... Um, who aren't, which, which is just a shame. And that's one of the reasons that uh, I wanted to write this book, was to reintroduce this absolutely fascinating story that uh, took place in the 1930s on the, uh, the Isle of Man, which is an island uh, in the Irish Sea in between uh, Ireland and England. And uh, it involved a, uh, a family named uh, the Irvings. Uh, there was uh, uh, James or Jim Irving, his wife, Margaret, and uh, started out their 12-year-old daughter, uh, Vori. Now, the, uh, the Irvings were actually transplants from England. Uh, Jim had been a salesman for a piano organ company uh, in, in Canada and uh, had been a, a very successful uh, salesman at that. Uh, uh, he was he was well traveled, well educated. They all they all were, um, but uh, because of World War One, sales uh, uh, fell out, and and he was starting to uh, get along in in age, 
And uh, they decided uh, his wife Margaret had family that uh, that lived on Man. And one time while they were visiting, uh, Jim found out that there was a farm for sale. Uh, its name was uh, um, um, Dorlish Cajun or uh, Cajun's Gap in in the English term. And uh, he decided that uh, this would be a good place to uh, to invest his 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 money. Uh, he had the idea that he was going to be a gentleman farmer. You know, somebody who uh, had hired hands that would actually do all the work, and he would just collect all the profits. So uh, he went and uh, uh, bought the farm, <laughs> bought the farm, uh, um, <laughs> and decided that um, uh, they would eventually move there. But uh, he spent some time actually uh, renovating the place. Uh, it had been built probably they think of the 19th century, though there is some evidence that it may be a lot older than that. It was a, uh, a large farm uh, in comparison to others in the, uh, on the island. And um, in the process of renovating the interior of this place, he put up wooden paneling as insulation on the uh, inside that left about a four-inch uh, air gap between the stone wall and uh, the wood paneling. Now, this will be significant later on in the story. At the time, they had two almost grown children that uh, spent a, a few years with their parents uh, on this farm, but then moved out, moved back to England, and uh, started families of their own. About the time that uh, their oldest children moved away, Margaret found herself uh, pregnant, and they had uh, a vori. Uh, which you know that's uh, at this point uh, they were you know, they were already in their fifties. So by the time that Jeff made his appearance, er, uh, Jim was already in his sixties, uh, and and Margaret uh, you know, was fo- following up not too far behind. So in 1931, uh, Jim claimed that uh, they started hearing something unusual in the walls of their house. At first he thought that uh, rats or some other kind of vermin had gotten inside. So he set up traps, poison, things like that. Nothing seemed to work. Out of frustration, he said, he barked at it like a dog. And whatever it was that was crawling around uh, in in this four-inch gap barked back. And that's how it started. Mm. They uh, 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 they would make noises at it, and it would repeat the noises back. And uh, then after a while, they noticed that it was making sounds, they said, similar to a baby when it's trying to learn how to talk, you know, baby-type noises. And, uh, you know, you would think that somebody would be like, okay, that's it. I'm out of here. Yeah. <laughs> you know, back up and move. Unfortunately, they did not have uh, the ability to do that uh, because the farm was not doing well, and they, you know, they were there to to stay. But their daughter Vori became fascinated by what was going on, and she started repeating nursery rhymes, and this voice would repeat back. Voice wasn't exactly what you would call. A normal human voice. Uh, I, I likened it uh, now to like Alvin and Chipmunks type of voice. Very, uh, they said it's very high pitched, uh, almost like a squeal. Uh, but it talked in identifiable words, and it progressed from there. It stopped. Not it. It, it no longer just mimicked or parrots the words back. But it also showed an intelligence. It would uh, form words and sentences on its own, and it just, uh, um, uh, it, it was like an avalanche. Once it started doing that, they couldn't shut it up. It, it talked incessantly. And eventually, it claimed that it, was a, that it was a mongoose that had been brought to the island in the early 1900s by a local farmer by the name of uh, um, Irvine, I think is, is what he said it was. And uh, uh, the, this farmer had uh, had bought uh, a, 
a bunch of mongoose from India and had them shipped over to and, and released in order to take care of the rabbit population, which at that point, I guess, had gone, uh, uh, gone crazy. Uh, the odd thing about that story is that Jim Irving was late, later able to find out from a local newspaper that this had actually happened, mm. that a local farmer had uh, bought a bunch of mongoose and, uh, and let them go. But this voice claimed that it was a physical creature, that it was a mongoose, that it wasn't a ghost, because naturally the Irvings, um, they thought that they were being haunted. That this well, that, was, I, I would think that would be their first you know, thought. I, I, I don't know where people's minds go if you have a voice mysteriously speaking right. from behind the wall, but I mean, I, that would be probably be the top of my list, thinking, wow, is this some kind of spirit or something? And that's exactly it. You know, I mean, in the early 1930s, there was a, uh, a really uh, uh, a new interest in psychic uh, phenomena and uh, uh, paranormal um, uh, 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 abilities. And a lot of this has, had to do with um, World War I. There were still a lot of people who were alive that remember and had you know, uh, relatives who died in World War I. And there was a, uh, a big offshoot of psychic mediums and trying to talk to say, like, uh, uh, relatives who had passed away during the war. Right. So they were very familiar with the idea of ghosts and hauntings, and, uh, um, uh, and naturally they thought that uh, this was a ghost. Um, but uh, Jeff said that, that he wasn't, and they actually, uh, every now and then, would catch a glimpse of something, uh, say, running uh, past the doorway or across the beams uh, in the ceiling, uh, Vori was the one who uh, managed to get better looks of it. And she said it was about 12 inches long, had, it, it was yellowish in color, and had a, uh, a long kind of like fluffy tail. Well, the description almost sounds like a small, you know, say like a, a red squirrel in, in North America. Right. But uh, now he, he said that, uh, uh, that, it was a, that he was a mongoose and was an actual physical creature. Now, I should say also that its story would vary from time to time. It, uh, it claimed that uh, at one point that uh, he was a, uh, what, I'm trying to remember exactly how to say it, that he was uh, a, a, a spirit of a, he was a spirit of a man in the shape of a weasel, and that he was going to haunt them with the sh- sound of rattling chains. Uh, he also claimed that he was the eighth wonder of the world. That's uh, where I got the uh, part, subtitle uh, for my book. Um, he, uh, he was he, the voice was extremely vo- boastful, verbose, and also um, it loved to uh, uh, curse, uh, especially at the very beginning. It, uh, it I suppose, kind of like a, 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 a child who's just learning their way. In the world, it would curse like a sailor. Um, it had an extremely bad temper, and in fact, uh, the Irvings moved their daughter into their bedroom at one point, which really outraged uh, Jeff. And you know, he would yell and scream and uh, create like a poltergeist type activity, and said that uh, told him that uh, he would find Vori no matter where they moved her, and uh, they they were extremely frightened at at first. Um, but uh, things calmed down after a while. They moved Bori back into her room, and then uh, it, it kind of became, you know, almost a, and you put quotation marks around this, a, you know, a normal situation, except that they had something weird in their house that was talking to them all So the how much time passed from when they first started to hear the noises to the point where this creature, if it was in fact a mongoose, was actually having full-on conversations with these folks? Less than a year. Oh wow! It was it, it it was that quick of a situation, and you know, uh, uh, Jim Irving actually kept a diary, so to speak, of day to day activities of of what uh, Jeff was doing, and it's you know it's uh, everything that Jeff would do it increased exponentially. You know, he it, it started to make noises. A few days later, it started to form you know, kind of like gurgling baby-like sounds. A few weeks later, it started to uh, 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 mimic uh, words back. 
And it just grew from there uh, to the point where they couldn't shut him up. Uh, <laughs> it's, he, it's one thing it, to have it's one thing to have a talking mongoose in your wall. It's another thing to have one that just won't be quiet. Uh, Tim, as uh, the Irvings were experiencing this behavior, did they have other people, third parties, if you will, come in and experience it as well in the lead up to all of this? I mean, just as it was getting started. Uh, yes, there uh, there were others that. Uh, uh, claimed that uh, that they heard uh, uh, Jeff uh, uh, one of them uh, uh, specifically was a uh, uh, a family friend by the name of um, uh, make sure that I, I get his <laughs> get his <laughs> name right here well uh, first of all okay uh, 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 there was a gentleman who uh, uh, whose name was uh, Captain James Dennis who had been uh, sent over to the Irvings uh, by the uh, paranormal investigator from England, Harry Price. Uh, now, uh, uh, Price wasn't able at first to, to go to the island to, to, to investigate himself, so he sent his friend, uh, uh, Captain uh, Dennis. So now, when Dennis first went there, um, he, uh, Jeff refused to talk. Refused to, uh, uh, you know, make a peep, squeeze, you know, wouldn't do anything. However, uh, he did produce uh, some interesting uh, uh, poltergeist activity. He he threw things at uh, uh, Captain Dennis. Uh, when you say when you say he, Tim, you're talking about Jeff the mongoose was was doing this, act, was yes, creating yes. this activity. Okay, right. Well, and, that okay, <laughs> and, and 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 again, you know, you have to re- realize that. Uh, um, I just want to make sure it wasn't Jim Irving that was doing that. This was Jeff. No, no, this was this was Jeff. I, uh, I, uh, uh, Jeff produced uh, uh, all kinds of interesting uh, uh, poltergeist type of activity. You know, uh, he moved furniture around. He uh, uh, threw rocks and stones and uh, packing needles. Um, he would. Um, uh, uh, allegedly, uh, uh, pee from cracks in the wall and from the ceiling, uh, and uh, just uh, you know, other really uh, uh, supernatural types of, of of incidents, rather than you know something that you would expect from uh, a, a, now, little, had, a little had, animal. Had uh, but, had the Ir- Irvings experienced that type of activity prior to the arrival of this paranormal investigator? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. they had. So the poltergeist type activity had uh, uh, preceded the arrival of this investigator. It didn't oh, happen. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. okay. I just want to warn you we've only got about a minute and a half here before we have to go to our next break. Did the Irvings send for this paranormal investigator? How did this Harry Price and his, and his uh, colleague hear about the activity to the point where they felt it was worth that trip? The uh, Irving story actually had uh, been picked up by not only local newspapers but uh, international papers as well. So, I mean, England uh, had become very familiar with the Irvings from papers like, say, like the Daily Mail and uh, and places like that. Were you able to, in your research for the book, able to find some of those articles? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, Not only have I found articles, but I also have found uh, writings uh, from uh, both the Irvings and Harry Price and other investigators that are now being uh, uh, kept at uh, various libraries. So when uh, Mr. Dennis got to the island and started his investigations, you said at first Jeff wouldn't do anything. We've got about a minute here before we have to jump into the break. But then poltergeist-type activity started. Was that Did, did the uh, Irvings and Mr. Dennis feel as though that was because Jeff was getting angry? Well, Jeff uh, told the Irvings that uh, he would not talk to anybody who didn't believe in him. And uh, according to Jeff, nobody believed in him. So when uh, a lot of these people would show up, Jeff refused to talk. But now on uh, uh, subsequent visits, uh, Dennis did uh, uh, hear Jeff talk and uh, uh, actually uh, you know, caught uh, brief glimpses of him. Did he certify that he believed that this was, in fact, whether it was mongoose or not, you know, obviously he couldn't be certain, but that it was something actually in the wall that was talking to them? Yes, yes. Uh, 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 Captain, uh, Captain Dennis did uh, confirm this with, uh, with Harry Price, that he believed that there was something unusual going on on that uh, farm. Interesting. Okay, we're talking with Tim Swartz. By the way, his website is Conspiracy Journal. 
Tim'sWorkShop.com. Pay that website a visit. Check out all of Tim's work, his books, and everything else he has on the website. We're going to take our break here. When we come back, we'll continue our conversation. Plus, we'll take your phone calls and questions at 844-687-7669. It's Beyond Reality Radio. Please support the program. Go to patreon.com slash johaw. That's J-O-H-A-W. Thank you for joining me tonight. It is a Monday slash Tuesday, and we are starting the week off right. Uh, Just to give you a preview of what's coming up the next few nights on Beyond Reality Radio, of course, always great guests. And uh, in the coming days, we actually have a number of returning guests with us. John Potash will be with us. He's an author and a documentarian. We'll be talking about his newly released film, which is based on his book of the same title called Drugs as Weapons Against Us, The CIA War on Musicians and Activists. Now, of course, we all know names like uh, Jimi Hendrix, John Lennon, Kurt Cobain, and others. Were these cultural leaders, I'll call them, musicians, were they targeted by the CIA and were the drugs that were apparently involved in their deaths, some of them we know about, some of them we may not, were they some type of murder weapon? Well, we'll talk to John Potash about that in the first hour of tomorrow night's program. The second hour, Rhonda and Dwight Hull will be with us. They are paranormal researchers and psychic mediums. We'll be talking about their new book called Conversations with Spirits of the Southwest, a continued journey into the paranormal. And then Wednesday night, Dr. Knowledge has been on the show a couple times. Always a great time. His real name is Charles Reichblum. And we'll be talking about his book called The All-Time Book of Fascinating Facts. Some really cool stuff uh, when we have a conversation with Charles. And then Thursday night, it'll be the first Thursday of February. Therefore, Rebecca Foster will will be with us to do um, her psychic readings. So uh, she'll invite your phone calls. And all night long, we'll take calls. We'll do readings. And uh, Rebecca will be here throughout the uh, whole program Thursday night. She'll also be with me on February 12th in Oneonta, New York. That's in upstate New York at the B-Side Ballroom and Supper Club for uh, a gallery reading. And if you're interested in that, if you're anywhere in the upstate New York area, um, check out the website at the B-Side Ballroom and Supper Club and see what's going on because there's a few tickets left from what I understand. And then uh, for the weekend, what are the dates of the weekend? 15th, 16th, and 17th, Rebecca and I will be at a convention called Dead by Con. A little bit of a weird name, but it is a horror film fan convention in Edmonton, Alberta. And it'll be happening all weekend long. And the website is deadbycon, B-Y for by, con, dot, C-A for Canada. whole bunch of celebrities are going to be there from pretty cool uh, movies. And um, Rebecca and I will be there. So if you uh, are in Canada, and I know it's a big place, but if you can get yourself to Edmonton, uh, do that because we'd love to see you. Uh, tonight we're talking with Tim Swartz about a number of his books. Particularly, we started the conversation about the eighth wonder of the world, or as we like to call him, Jeff the Talking Mongoose. Um, Tim, again, thanks for being here. I, I wanted to ask you before we got back into the story here, though. Um, you've got a lot of books. Have written about a lot of topics. How many books to your credit right now? Oh my gosh. <laughs> Uh, Too many to count. Huh? <laughs> Too many to count. <laughs> I have lot. Well, and, uh, more than more than ten. I'll put it that way. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's it's quite an eclectic body of work covering a lot of different topics. Again, I invite people to go to conspiracyjournal dot com to check out the list of titles. So, as we're talking about Jeff, the talking mongoose, and the Irving family, who uh, whose house, whose home Jeff uh, inhabited, um, just so I understand here, other than catching glimpses. You know, maybe running through the ceiling rafters or here and there just kind of catching a tail or something along those lines. Did they ever really get a good, straight-on, full-eye view of Jeff? I suppose the closest uh, that anybody ever got was around um, 1935. Vori was able to catch a series of photographs of Jeff using a camera that was provided to her by uh, uh, Harry Price. Uh, Jeff agreed that he would uh, jump up on the, uh, the gate that led up to the property and that Vori would uh, take pictures of him, but uh, he told her that she would have to uh, 
she would have to be on on alert and do it really fast because he wasn't going to hang around for long. So, you know, according to Vori, he would just, like, uh, uh, appear out of the hedge and just run across the, uh, the fence, and she would snap a picture. Most of the pictures that she took, uh, nothing came out. But there were about uh, uh, four or five uh, photographs, uh, which I've included in the book, where something is is seen. Now the you know skeptics and, and and debunkers say that it looks like that maybe you know she took a stuffed toy, or you know maybe you know a, a fur for her mom, or or even as far as you know the skin pelt from a rabbit, and uh, posed it. Uh, on these, you know, on the fence, uh, but um, you know that's uh, that's probably about the uh, the best evidence that we have when it comes to you know like photographs or or, or, or things like well, that. Well, what about um, uh, Captain Dennis or Harry Price uh, as paranormal investigators? And I know that recording devices were not you know very common in the early '30s. Um, cameras were a little more common, but not super common either. Uh, but did they get, were they professional investigators enough that they would have carried recording equipment? And did they, if they did, did they, did they capture anything? The closest that anybody had at that time would have been a dictaphone, uh, which was a, uh, a, a fairly large instrument. And, um, uh, the nicer ones would have required, uh, electricity, uh, which the Irvings, uh, their their farm had uh, no electricity, no running, you know, no no radio, uh, nothing like that. Uh, there there was a um, a type of dictaphone that used wax cylinders right. that you could actually just manually turn it. That's right. And uh, but uh, 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 one of the investigators actually you know brought one out to the farm, but. Like a lot of poltergeist cases, it refused to work. And this, you know, again, this was a manual one. It required that you crank it, and then you know, uh, whomever was was talking would would speak into almost like a uh, like a gramophone type of, of like a big foot. horn, yeah, kind of a big horn. Right. They were and, talking uh, to Jeff. Yeah. Jeff was talking, but the device would not operate. It was like it was frozen in place. I imagine that would have been difficult to catch any audio anyway, since it was kind of non-directional audio. If it was coming out of the wall, that yeah, would have been exactly. that would have been very very difficult. You know, it's hard to imagine the day when um, "quote unquote" paranormal investigators were going into the field without any kind of electronic devices at all, and, and that's that's kind of what they were dealing with. You know, it's it's frustrating when um, you investigate a case like this because you see so many opportunities that were lost. Uh, in in trying to to do a proper investigation of this case, I mean, for instance, um, Jim Irving was basically the uh, spokesperson for the entire family. Uh, uh, there are some some quotes from his wife Margaret, who apparently had a, uh, a a lot of conversations with Jeff and actually even touched him a couple of times. But um, nobody really took the time to sit down with her and interview her for, for any long periods. Uh, the, the same with Vori. Um, Jim Irving kept Vori at a distance from uh, the male investigators. He was uh, very suspicious of, of anybody that wanted to talk to her in private. There's actually a, a, a picture of, of Jim and Vori and uh, a gentleman by the name of uh, Robert Lampert, who uh, uh, co-wrote, co-wrote the book uh, The Haunting of Cashin's Gap with Harry Price. They're sitting on a bench, and uh, Jim is sitting like right in between, almost like a chaperone. <laughs> now, d- did the Irvings uh, profit from any of this? No, not at all. Not at all. The, so you, so the, you'd have to say there really wasn't a profit motivation um, if if there was some kind of hoax going on. No, the uh, 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 Harry Price when they when he published the book, The Haunting of Cash and Gap, which was a which sold very poorly. It sold like maybe four hundred copies at the most, and then and then was you know, was, there was never a second printing. 
uh, he sent uh, the Irvings uh, a check for like ten pounds, and that was it. Jeez. Oh, yeah. And, well, uh, I mean, so, do, you th- do you th- do you think that the Irvings expected it to be a a successful book, and therefore they would have expected to profit and just didn't? No, I don't think so. Uh, Jim Irving often said that um, you know he didn't want to accept because I mean there there were instances where you know like some of these newspapers offered to to pay money you know to come and talk to them and Irving Norris uh, refused it because he he thought that it would um, it would actually sully uh, their reputation and you know convince uh, debunkers that everything was a hoax. Um. They didn't charge admission or have people come in and tour the home or any of that stuff, right? No. Yeah. No, nothing, like, nothing like that. We're talking with Tim Schwartz. We're talking about Jeff the Talking Mongoose. And, uh, Tim, what was the final disposition here? And how many, how many years did this go on, and how did this story kind of come to an end? The case started around uh, 1931, and uh, according to Vory. Uh, Jeff was uh, last seen around uh, 1938 or 1939, so you know, almost uh, almost 10 years. For uh, now, you know, I mean, if uh, you're familiar with any kind of poltergeist activity, uh, you know, it, it lasts really just a brief period of time. So, so Jeff had a lot of stamina to him, a lot of energy. Uh, you know, it, it's it's very frustrating because after Harry Price uh, uh, published his book in 1936, all information uh, coming from the Irvings just dried up. Uh, uh, we really, with the exception of uh, uh, Dr. Nandor Fordor, who was a, uh, a parapsychologist and associate of Sigmund Freud, visited the farm in 1936 and came back with a, uh, a few new stories. But after that, uh, all information just, just disappeared. Now, in 1970, a, a journalist by the name of Walter McGraw actually tracked Vory down uh, in, in England. She was 52 years old at the time, and uh, he was able to uh, convince her to, uh, uh, to, to talk to him. And uh, she claimed that everything that was written about Jeff, all the reports, were true. That uh, there was something in their house that talked, whether it was an actual little animal or a ghost, poltergeist, familiar, you know, what have you. She said that it, it all actually happened and that nobody had faked it. She said that she actually... Um, wished it had never happened, because she said it basically ruined her life. Wow. She, never, she never got married, because she was afraid that if, you know, a potential suitor found out that she was that girl, you know, involved with Jeff talking to Mongoose, that that would be it. And uh, so, I mean, we're left with um, uh, Jeff kind of arrived with a bang, but then just uh, just faded away. So, uh, in all your research and everything that you did uh, to put the book together, um, you probably looked into this more than anybody has. What, um, what are your opinions, or what were the opinions of those who might have uh, um, you know, direct access to the, to the knowledge of what Jeff the Talking Mongoose actually was? Was it truly a, a, a mongoose that could talk? Was it an alien? Was it interdimensional? Was it a, a, a mongoose that was uh, harboring the, the spirit of somebody else? What do you think it was? Well, and of course now, you know, I mean, my, my opinion on the matter means nothing. But um, I, I definitely I don't think that this was an actual physical uh, uh, creature that you know, somehow had gained uh, the, the power to speak. I mean, there's, there's just too many paranormal-type elements to this story to, 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 to lead me to believe that this was just and, you know, just with the quotation marks around it, you know, an extra clever little mongoose that somehow had learned <laughs> right, to talk. Right. Um, but now, um, you know, I mean, you could you could speculate, you know, endlessly. I mean, you know, there, the Isle of Man has a rich tradition of, you know, like fairies and brownies and hobs, and uh, a lot of the stuff that uh, that Jeff did... Uh, really harkens back to these old stories of, of house spirits, you know, elemental types of, of, of 
creatures that uh, would live in a house and would take care of the family as long as the family uh, fed and took care of it, which the Irvings did. Uh, Jeff liked to eat uh, like bacon and chocolate and things like that. But if you if you got it mad, then you know it uh, uh, <laughs> it would not uh, it would not be very polite. To, well, uh, Jeff to Jeff made a few threats along the way, didn't he? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, he he was constantly threatening people. Uh, he threatened the Irvings. He, you know, anybody who would come to visit that he didn't like, and he didn't like very many people. Um, you know, he would uh, he would tell them that uh, he would uh, uh, follow them back to uh, where they came from and puncture their tires or kill their livestock. You know, things like that. You know, most of the time these were just empty threats. Though a couple of times uh, he claimed that he. You know, I like killed poultry at the you know, neighboring uh, farms that uh, that didn't believe the Irving story. Hmm. I have to assume um, we've got about a minute here. Uh, I have to assume that when the investigations were done um, and they were hearing the voice of Jeff, they were also monitoring the whereabouts of the family members at the time. Yes, um, uh, the majority of the time that they would hear the voice, that uh, everybody would be nearby. There were times where. Uh, Vori would actually be away from the house, you know, out uh, taking care of chickens, yet Jeff continued uh, uh, to talk. Now, the odd thing is, is that after Vori uh, moved to England in 1939 to work as a wartime machinist, Jeff stopped talking, mm. but the poltergeist activity continued in the house. Oh, it did? Okay. His website is conspiracyjournal.com. He's written many books, including the book we've been talking about, Jeff the Talking Mongoose, The Eighth Wonder of the World. He's also written Time Travel, Fact, Not Fiction, America's Strange and Supernatural History, and The Lost Journals of Nikola Tesla. Um, a lot of great stuff there, Tim. And I'd love to continue talking about Jeff, the talking mongoose, but I really wanted to touch on a couple of these other topics that you've written about as well, um, particularly uh, Nikola Tesla. Uh, tell us about The Lost Journals of Nikola Tesla. Oh, sure. Well, this this was a book that uh, uh, I had published in uh, the year 2000. And uh, this basically uh, dealt with um, uh, Tesla's extensive collection of, of papers, notes, uh, what have you, that uh, mysteriously uh, disappeared after uh, he passed away. Uh, Tesla, uh, you know, of course, was the person that uh, developed the, uh, the AC motor and our modern-day uh, uh, electrical system. Uh, he also had this dream of uh, being able to uh, send uh, electricity uh, wirelessly. Um, and uh, he also developed, uh, uh, at the time, what he called uh, a, a death beam, or death ray. It actually, uh, the newspapers called it a death ray, but... Uh, uh, Tesla cor always corrected him, said it was a death beam, that there was a difference between a beam and a ray, and that uh, uh, we now know that uh, essentially it was a particle beam uh, a weapon, what we now call a particle beam weapon. But um, after Tesla passed away, the United States government became very interested in uh, what Tesla had, uh, unfortunately, they had ignored him in the last uh, years of his life, but after he died, um, the, the FBI, along with the, uh, the Office of Alien Property, came in and uh, uh, took everything that they could find, uh, uh, took them to a warehouse to be examined. And uh, the, the odd thing about this is that uh, one of the people that they had come in and go through all of this material uh, was a gentleman uh, from MIT by the name of uh, John Trump, who uh, was the paternal uncle of uh, now President Trump. <laughs> so uh, um, uh, a lot of this material ended up uh, 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 disappearing after the uh, uh, Office of Alien Properties uh, uh, took a hold of it. Uh, uh, some of it we know ended up at uh, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, Others uh, ended up uh, with DARPA and various other facilities, and then a lot ended up uh, in the hands of the Soviet Union uh, because um, you know Tesla was born in uh, um, 
what is now would be Croatia. And so uh, Yugoslavia actually petitioned uh, the United States for a number of years to get hold of this material, and it eventually ended up at the Tesla Museum in uh, Belgrade. We, um, you know, many of us who are familiar with the story of Tesla uh, know about the death beam, know about his vision for wireless electricity transmission. Um, and, you know, he was working on a lot of projects simultaneously. Uh, and if these journals held the key to a lot of these ideas and they were taken, um, have we ever have we seen any of these technologies um, be introduced uh, elsewhere that may have been the result of those journals? Uh, being taken from Tesla's home. Now, one of the uh, one of the interesting things is that um, in um, in the nineteen in nineteen eighty, the uh, Aviation Week in Space Technology uh, published a U.S. Sat- satellite reconnaissance photo of a suspected Soviet uh, uh, beam weapon installation. Uh, Researchers who examined this photograph couldn't help uh, but notice that it bore a striking resemblance to uh, Tesla's uh, uh, diagrams, or at least the ones that uh, uh, have been made available to you know the, uh, the rest of us and haven't been you know scrolled away somewhere. Uh, Tesla in 1936 actually um, sold a number of his uh, research papers to uh, the Soviet Union through a, uh, uh, an arm in, uh, an armed company that uh, was located in the United States. Um, uh, obviously, the Soviets were pretty happy with what they got because a couple of years later, they actually uh, uh, paid Tesla a, uh, uh, another, I think it was around $25,000, and uh, uh, you know, noted that uh, the the material that they had that he had provided them uh, was was working properly. Unfortunately, that's all we know about uh, uh, what uh, the Soviets may have been doing, with the exception of some unusual reports, especially you know from the 1960s, from places like uh, Iran that uh, that that bordered. Uh, you know, the then Soviet Union that uh, seemed to show some kind of you know unusual weapons uh, testing uh, taking place. Now I know for sure that the United States was working on Tesla material because I worked uh, at a uh, television station in Dayton, Ohio, in the uh, early 1980s, and uh, one of our beats was uh, Wright Patterson Air Force Base. So one day I was there with a reporter. And the uh, press liaison was, you know, looking for the, looking through the files, you know, trying to see if there was, you know, something of interest that we could do a story on. And we'd do a story like every couple of weeks from Wright Patterson. And uh, this lieutenant made this kind of offhand remark, saying that, oh, you know, we've got, uh, you know, we're doing some research on that mad scientist Nikola Tesla, uh, but uh, I really can't talk about that now. And then he went on to something else. And that's you know that's that's how I got interested in Tesla to begin with. So uh, the uh, actually then years later, uh, 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 I think 2013, the FBI released a bunch of their documents uh, about Tesla, and uh, in these documents uh, was a letter around the same time that I was uh, that I was in Dayton from a uh, this was from a general at Wright Patterson uh asking the FBI if they had any more material uh from Tesla that uh, that they would like to have it and of course you know the FBI wrote back and said well we never had any uh material that was taken by the office of alien property so <laughs> you know it's uh, uh and of course I have to remind you that this was the time that Reagan had started the whole uh, strategic space defense initiative, or Star Wars, as, as the, the the press called it. So there was a scramble uh, from all all sorts of different places, you know, research uh, facilities in the country, looking for ways to develop space based, you know, especially you know, energy or particle beam type weapons. Some people say that the uh, concept, Tesla's concept of wireless electricity transmission, um, 
could have or would have been realized had it not been for uh, maybe some corporate interests that would that killed the idea. You, did you come across any of that, and do you believe it to be true? Oh, definitely. Uh, Tesla first uh, developed this concept. Uh, he had built a laboratory out of Colorado Springs, Colorado. Uh, he, you know, he went out there at first to see if there was any way that, uh, that he could harness uh, lightning. Uh, from from thunderstorms, but uh, while he was out there, he developed the idea of, uh, of Earth resonance. And uh, now, you know, I have to remind you that you know I'm not a, I'm not a scientist. I'm a journalist, so you know I'm going to uh, just really give a layman's explanation on what uh, uh, Tesla was working on. But um, you know, he came up with this idea that. Uh, he could actually send a resonance wave both through the air and through the earth that uh, that worked like almost like a uh, like a sine wave, you know, with peaks and valleys. And within those peaks of va- peaks and valleys, uh, somebody at a different location could put an antenna both you know in the air and into the ground and um, uh, pick up this uh, this electricity that was being transmitted. Now. Tesla was convinced that this was work based on his experiments and even went as far as to begin building a huge facility out on Long Island, New York. Um, uh, is, that, is that where the tower was? I'm trying yes. to, yeah. And what, there was a name for that. I don't remember what the name of it. Warden Cliff. Right, there we go. Yeah, yeah. He called, he called, he called it Warden Cliff. And, and he got his, most of his money was backed by uh, 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 J.P. Morgan. Right, and uh, Tesla had told Morgan that uh, this was going to be a like a wireless like a wireless facility, like a radio uh, transmitter, where uh, uh, and, and eventually uh, you'd be able to do you know like telephone and even rudimentary uh, video. He neglected to tell Morgan though that this would this facility would also be able to transmit electricity wirelessly. And when uh, Morgan found out about this, he asked Tesla, he says, well, okay, how are we going to meter this? How are we going to make money off of it? And, you know, Tesla said, well, you know, I'll, I, you know, I'll be able to come up with, you know, with ways, but I'm not interested in that right now. And so uh, Morgan uh, uh, withdrew his funds and convinced the, uh, Tesla's other backers to do the same. And then, unfortunately, um, Tesla was never able to to finish this tower, so we don't know whether or not it actually would have worked or not. I think it would have worked. Tesla would have never have gone this far. Uh, he was not the type of person to go and then you know, build something like this if he wasn't convinced it was going to work. And are we convinced that the journals that uh, disappeared after his death may have com- contained those secrets? Uh, some of them, yes. Um, uh, un- unfortunately, when Tesla was alive, yeah, he had been, you know, uh, robbed uh, a number of times uh, from competitors. Uh, uh, um, Albert Edison uh, uh, was one of them. His patents were were often stolen. So when Tesla would have a patent issued, he would neglect to add important details um, to these patents. I mean, we 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 have his patents and some of his research notes on uh, his wireless transmitting array, but there are there's missing pages. There's missing material. Some of it has showed up in Belgrade, which the uh, uh, the curators at this at the Tesla Museum will not allow Western uh, reporters, investigators, scientists to look at this stuff. What has changed since the collapse of the Soviet Union? Um, has, has any of this stuff? Has there been any more cooperation on in, uh, researching any of this, or is it still is it still secret? Not much. There really? have been a couple. There have been a couple of uh, like documentaries that have been shot, where the curators allowed the uh, uh, the producers to catch a glimpse of, of say like the first page from these files. But then that that would be it. They would say that they you know they would tell the producers then that they don't have like the proper credentials or anything like. Nobody 
from the West seems to have the proper credentials. <laughs> it's funny how that works, isn't it? Yeah, it's like that old war, that old Cold War mentality still exists. Yeah. Um, well, it almost seems to be coming back. Uh, and we, 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 I don't know if we can, if we are calling it the Cold War yet, but we certainly are in a similar situation with uh, Russia, despite the fact it's no longer the Soviet Union. Um, one more thing I wanted to touch on, and we only have a couple minutes now to be able to do this, but you wrote about time travel, too. In fact, I think one of your books was actually kind of a how-to, isn't it? <laughs> the, uh, the, the early version of uh, the book that uh, you referenced at the beginning, Time Travel Fact Talk Fiction, was called Time Travel, a How-To Guide. <laughs> 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 and uh, uh, it... You know, it uh, uh, it deals somewhat with uh, you know some of these uh, uh, stories that have come out of you know people who were experimenting, say you know like with uh, uh, radios and things like that, and you know claim that uh, they then uh, uh, had like time travel experiences. You know, I mean, you know, I, I touch on those stories, you know, with my tongue planted firmly, <laughs> you know, in my cheek. Right. But, uh, you know, there's, there's other stories, you know, like time slips and, and things like that that I think um, have a lot more uh, of veracity to them. Uh, and, and, you know, I, 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 look at, I look to those, you know, uh, you know really a lot, uh, a lot closer, uh, you know, because I think that uh, there, there does seem to be some kind of natural phenomena, for one of a, you know, for one of a better term, that uh, seems to almost be a form of of time travel. <laughs> and uh, in the minute we have less left, Tim, what else are you working on now? Oh my gosh! Well, um, I'm always uh, working on something. I'm actually I'm, I'm helping Timothy Green Beckley uh, uh, finish up a book about uh, his uh, experiences uh, in the '70s with. Uh, People like uh, uh, David Bowie and, uh, uh, and and people like that who were interested in you know the occult and psychic phenomena. And when will uh, I mean is that something that you're going to be referenced in, or are you just helping him do that work? Well, uh, I may be referenced <laughs> in it. You know, <laughs> I mean, are you, are you a contributing writer to it? I guess was my was more appropriately the question. <laughs> Well, yeah, to 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 a certain extent, right. right? You know, I'm I'm helping Tim, you know, like do the formatting and, and, and right. you know, and things like. All that. All right, one more time, give folks uh, your website and where else they can follow your work and get a hold of your books. Sure. Well, all of my books uh, can be found at Amazon.com. Uh, my website is conspiracyjournal.com. Uh, we we put out a weekly email newsletter that uh, you can uh, uh, sign up for it on our website. And, uh, you know, we, we send it out for free. It's an aggregate of the week's uh, uh, best uh, weird paranormal types of stories from, uh, from all over the world. And, uh, you know, it's all the uh, strange and weird news that uh, they don't want you to know. And it's the stuff we love. Tim, thank you so much for being here. It's a fascinating conversation, and we hope that you'll agree to come back at some point. Oh, my pleasure, JV. Thanks for having me on. By the way, if if you uh, follow me on Facebook, and you should, just go to Facebook, go to uh, JVJ Paranormal or just JV Johnson. You can find it either way. You'll know that I had mentioned earlier on Facebook tonight that I was going to start cooking again, and many have asked what I ended up cooking. Well, um, uh, you know, don't judge me here, but I'm on a diet, and um, I needed to uh, cook broccoli in some fashion. So I made a little broccoli casserole thing. Because I figure, uh, and tell me if my logic is correct here, if you eat broccoli, it doesn't matter what you put on top of it, it's still good for you, right? So the fact that I had it smothered in cheese and breadcrumbs and stuff doesn't take away from the fact that broccoli was a good diet choice, right? (laughs) That's what I'm going to go with, okay. (laughs) Tomorrow night, we've got a couple of guests for you. The first hour, John Potash will be with us to talk talk about his new documentary, Drugs as Weapons Against Us, The CIA War on Musicians and activists and then then in the second hour of the show it'll be Rhonda and dwight hall talking about their new book called conversations with spirits of the southwest a continued journey into the paranormal 
So we've got a lot going on uh, all week long. Great stuff. Be sure to join us. I'm JV Johnson. Thanks for being here. Beyond Reality Radio it will be heard every night this week, as it always is. But don't forget, Friday night is a best of program. And we'll catch you all of those nights. It's Beyond Reality Radio. Thanks for being here. Beyond Reality Paranormal is hosted by J.V. Johnson and produced by Orion Palmer and Slick Eddie Edwards. Like us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Please consider supporting the program either through your podcast platform, click on the link in the description, or on Patreon at Joha Productions. If you'd like to be a guest on Beyond Reality Paranormal or you have a recommendation for a guest, contact our producer, Slick Eddie Edwards. Eddie is spelled with a Y at slickeddieedwards at gmail.com.